Well, hello, United, and whoever is looking. Wasn't that a wonderful treat? I know you were expecting one thing, but you got four <laughs> players today. And so sometimes it's nice to have pleasant surprises that greet us along the way. We come to that time where we dig into the word, and today we are still in the first gospel, the first book of the New Testament, St. Matthew's. We are looking at the 25th chapter, and we are reading today beginning with verse 31. You can either follow or you can close your eyes and listen closely. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goat at the left. Then the king will say to all those at his right hand, Come, you are blessed by your God. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it for one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. May the Lord add our blessing to the reading of God's holy word. Today we come to the fourth and final in a series of gratitude, focusing on gratitude and our sermonic theme for today is the gift of serving others. The gift of serving others. Let us pray. Dear Lord, even though many of us are confined to our homes, we are moving, we are on Zoom calls, we are doing and busy and active and moving. And so right now, Lord, help us to pause Help us to resist the temptation to do three things at one time. And help us to enter into this holy space of listening to you, of hoping that your word becomes illuminated for us one more time. Bless the message. Bless the hearer. And bless the messenger. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hello, hello folks gathered out there. Again today, uh, for our final series, uh, the sermon is The Gift of Serving Others. The Gift of Serving Others. One day, a long time ago, my second job out of college, still trying to make money to pay those student loans, I arrived to work just a little bit earlier, and what caught my eyes was a little bit disturbing. I saw this man struggling. He obviously was in distress and he obviously wasn't doing well. I saw him struggling to walk down the street. 
It was in the morning, it was a busy time, people were rushing to work, trying to get in, check in on time. And what was disturbing for me is that people sort of just walked on by this man. That even in much of his distress, nobody really stopped to help him or to even ask a question. And he was moving slow, like, like a snail, <laughs> moving super, super slow. And he continued to struggle, and people continued to walk on by. This situation has stayed with me many times, even as I've read the scripture about the Samaritan. But it stayed with me because I imagine that oftentimes it's easy to see someone in need. It's harder to do something about it. The struggling, the poor, the needy can sometimes feel like a taxation on us. Everywhere you go, it seems like there's someone that needs something, someone that is in distress. It can feel like an intrusion on our life, like what can I possibly do? And if you're feeling like that, if you're feeling like that, I want you to listen just a little bit longer. Sometimes we aren't in a position to give, and all this month I've been pushing back a little bit at the text, but many times we are. We are in a position to give. And so the text in Matthew today challenges us. The question that's before us in this text today is how do we respond to human need? How do we respond when we see people struggling on the streets? How do we respond when we find out that someone is really, really having a hard time? And the gospel even here has an opinion. The writers, the editors, redactors of this text come across pretty harsh about how we are to respond to those in need. This is our fourth Sunday of focusing on gratitude. Today we are looking at service that flows out of our gratefulness. To be so utterly blessed by God leads one to share out of a state of being so blessed. We share our all on week two. We shared the truth last week. And on the first week of this gratitude series, we reminded that as we share the all, as we share the truth, and even as we serve one another, we do it from a space of humility. We serve from a place of equality, not that we are better than, but that we are all on the same level as God's creation. At the crux of serving others is helping to lift someone else up, encouraging another soul. One family two years ago, when a member was dying from cancer, offered their home as a place of hospice. That means when they found out someone that they knew in their church was dying, and that because he was gay and that his sister was very judgmental, they decided to open up their home so that he, this dying gay man, could have a safe space in which to cross over. And they took and fixed up their back porch, and they put a bed out there, and they put him on it. And for the two weeks that he was there with them, they provided meals and companies and medical care and asked me how I know, because on Thanksgiving, it was Thanksgiving two years ago, I got invited to this home. And I stepped in and I saw this man that was in hospice and I sat around a table and I shared a meal. And I thought, what a beautiful way to serve another. Here was this person with one foot already leaving this world and yet being cared for with kindness. And we sat around a table that Thanksgiving as he uttered, as tears flowed from his eye, how grateful he was to be alive. Even though I knew those days were numbered, he was still grateful and appreciative that someone had provided a space for him for his last days on earth. And we shared a meal that day and we laughed and he talked and he was grateful. I asked my friend what led her to open up her home and family, her whole family, her kids, to someone else. And she said these words, if I were that someone in need, I would want someone to do the same thing for me, to do it for me. The text today says, as we do it for the least of these, at the bare minimum, one of the gifts of serving others is that we help somebody else. 
no matter where they are on life's journey. My own mother was in line at the grocery store a couple of years back. She only had a few items, and when she tried to pay for them, the cashier said, no, keep your money. That lady that was ahead of you decided to pay for your groceries. Now she said to me jokingly, had I known she was going to pay for my groceries, I'd have thrown a few more things <laughs> in the basket. But she didn't know, and she simply got what she needed. And when she arrived at the cashier, she said, I'm wondering, do I look a certain way? But this lady had decided to pay randomly for different people, and my mom was one of them. And just because she had only four items in the basket, it blessed her. It blessed her that some stranger she had never seen and didn't know would pay for her groceries. It encouraged her. And as she left the store, she left with a warm feeling that this stranger would do this kind act. When we do service to others, we help the stranger. We help lift someone up. We help bless and encourage a soul. We don't know the power sometimes of how much it is a blessing to serve others. The real gift of serving others is when there's no expectation in return. When a gift is to be able to do something for someone else because of your understanding that God calls us to serve and to expect nothing from the person you're serving. It is such a beautiful place and a spiritually mature place when we can pour out love and kindness to others simply because we're called to serve and we don't expect anything back from them. So many times I look at commercials and now I say to my son, whenever we're looking at a commercial and he's getting caught up, what's the purpose of a commercial? And he says it's to get us to buy something. He says, but that really looks good. But what's the purpose of a commercial? The purpose of a commercial is to get us to buy something. And so they make us feel like we need this thing. But in the world of being a follower of Christ, we do things not to get people to do anything back. We give with no expectation because we are called from a space of being so grateful for how good that God has been to us. We're not marketing. We're not trying to get your money. We're just trying to love up on you because Christ first loved us. Serving others helps others. But guess what? Serving others helps us. Yesterday, a friend of mine, for her very own birthday, helped put together 200 boxes with others for those in need. This church will give out 1,000 boxes. I'm amazed, but it's a mega church. It's a bigger church. And there she was working, and she sent me a video, and she was moving, and I was like, goodness gracious. She usually moves slow, but she was moving pretty fast, moving corn and separating and getting things into boxes. Every year this friend goes out of country to help in another country to participate with Habitat. Every since she turned 40, every year she goes to another country and she gives. And for her, on her birthday, serving others blesses her. But this year, she wasn't going to be able to do it because of COVID. But at the last minute, this opportunity arose for her to meet out with these people at a church and to put boxes together. Serving others is not only good for others, but it is good for us. I could already tell she was blessed, and by the time she got home, her body was aching. Her body was exhausted, but her spirit, her spirit was refreshed. I could tell that serving others had given her this different kind of energy. Prior to COVID, we served hot meals on Saturdays. Tired and weary souls poured in. They would stand in line and wait for entrance. And they would eat and eat incredibly. They had like unlimited stomachs. Sometimes they would take food home and they would drink. And they would sit back. And some people that came to our open buffet said absolutely nothing. But there were others that would sit. And their shoulders would relax. And their countenance would change. And they would begin to have conversations with one another. And I would see a miracle of sorts as people who are treated in a certain kind of way were given dignity and respect. If you've never served in our open breakfast, it is such an honor and quite a place to observe. But those weren't the only people that were being blessed. 
There would be conversation to, between Boy Scouts and college students serving special service hour and seniors, mature seniors and other volunteers there. One of the funniest things is that one of the funnest things that I have done at United is serving at open breakfast. I feel leaving lighter no matter what countenance I enter, no matter how bad or what kind of struggles or conflicts we're in, somehow coming to open breakfast feels like church too. And I know I'm not the only one. There is a real magic that happens at our bro open breakfast. And it doesn't just happen to the people that we're serving, but it happens to the people that serve. I think there is this opportunity for us to experience some new magic even as we're challenged by COVID. What are the other ways that God might be calling us right now to serve? Oh, don't look at the problems, but begin to imagine that God might be calling us to a new kind of magic, a new kind of way of helping others in this COVID season. When we help others, we not only help them, but we help, we help ourselves. And last, when we serve others, we not only are helping others, we're not only helping ourselves, but we are helping, we're helping God out. You see, the text today says, as you've done it for the least of these, you've done it for me. I would like to lay before you this proposition that as we do service, we become the feet, we become the eyes, we become the hands, and we become the heart of God. When we sow kindness in our worlds, we are ambassadors of God. And God needs a lot of hands and a lot of feet and a lot of heart and a lot of prayer. Yesterday, I saw a video. I saw a video of a restaurant in Michigan. And because I just saw it yesterday, I wasn't going to do this to our media person. But in this restaurant were hordes of people. I mean, the restaurant was packed. And not one person had a mask on their face. Waiters are running around serving people. It's a bar, restaurant. There's kids, there are people. And I don't know what was going on, but this restaurant was packed. I looked at the day, and the date said that it had only been recorded a day before, and it was on Fox News. Interesting, Fox News there. But Fox News had recorded this restaurant in Michigan who it seemed like was worlds and worlds away from where we are today. And so I began to think and muse about what I was watching. And then I did something that I'm told you shouldn't do. I began to read the comments <laughs> under the video. And so I'd like to share a little bit of those comments with you. More restaurants need to do this. If you're scared, stay your butt at home. Oh yeah, and if you get sick, stay at home. And don't clog up the ER with your selfish behavior. Gets you and your loved ones sick. Uh, I've known a handful of people who've had it. It's like the flu. Do you stay at home for the flu every season? You do realize you are supposed to stay at home when you have the flu, right? Guess you better not go to the grocery store, gas station, or Target than a risk being called just another liberal hypocrite. Stay home when you have the flu, not all flu season. Arguing with you liberals is like beating my head against a brick wall. Believe me, we feel the same way when trying to explain to you MAGA nutcases. It's worse than the flu. No one on this post will likely read this, but it comes from John Hopkins, the expert. It explains the virus and why it is more dangerous and why it is more dangerous than the flu. These conversations went on and on. This post had been shared over 100,000 times in one day and back and forth and back and forth. And I asked God, what would it look like for more committed people to serving others than going to war? because that's what we're doing. We've won an election, but what have we really won? I still feel good about the election, I'm not gonna lie. But we know we are facing something much more graver. 
Serving others is a beginning, but it, I suspect it's going to take a whole lot more than serving others to heal our country. But I do know that service begins to connect us. It begins to build relationships. And maybe somehow we can stop this tear that is happening in our country. Reverend William Barber, with Moral Mondays on financial disparity in our country, chooses not to focus on the left or the right. Maybe that's not the way, but he focuses on the fact that there are people who are in financial need. And let's address that through policy, and let's that address that through the Senate, and let's address that through our government. We have a population that we feed over and over again that are hungry. We have mental illness that abounds. I was just in Jules the other day when this man was hollering and hollering, and I looked at his caretaker, and I saw how tired she was. Security was called in. We have a mental health crisis in our country. We have so many crises going on in our country. And maybe we can begin to not focus on whether you're on the left or the right, but the real needs that are happening in our country. There's a love fridge right here in Chicago. And one day when me and my son were walking our dog, we stumbled upon the love fridge. I don't know how many of you have seen the love refrigerator. Anyway, it's beautiful. It's got all this beautiful paint. It's over on 57th near the co-op store. It's in an alley and we opened it up and there was milk and there was meat and there was vegetables and there was all kinds of food. And I learned and I had been hearing about this, that this love fridge, there are several of them all across the city. And the beauty of the love fridge is anybody can come and open it up and get what they need. Any of us can donate. They're all over the city, as you do for the least of these. We're in a time where serving others doesn't just help others out, and it doesn't just help ourselves, but it helps our God. I imagine the people that had this brilliant idea are helping God out. They are being the hands and the feet and the heart and the spirit and you can get your food and go home and eat and shelter and be safe. I came across this another organization that is helping the LGBT community out with utilities. If they are struggling, they give so much money every six months. It's not a lot, but I still imagine that they are being the hands and the feet and the heart of God. Folks are fixing turkey baskets for people that don't have. And even when we were doing Once Upon a Time Open Breakfast, I imagined that we were the hands and the feet and the heart of God. I believe that as we do for the least of these, because the text says it, we help. We help God out. Gratitude is something we cultivate. Sometimes it doesn't come naturally because we can be complainers. We know even though we preach, don't complain, come on. We still probably complain a little bit. We get caught up. But gratitude is something that is intentional. We do it. We cultivate it. And often it's not the person with so much that is grateful. But oftentimes the people that are the most grateful are people who have the least. I get the greatest warmth and kindness and fellowship from folks who are homeless on the street. They always speak. They always greet me. They always have a high. They always have a God is good. They always have a smile. Amazing. Altered states or unaltered states. They give me a smile on the streets. Today I want to end here. As we're talking about gratitude, I want to end with this story. But it's never too late to join the gratitude journey. As we approach Thanksgiving with its mixed messages, depending on who you are in these United States of America, we invite people to be grateful. And it's never too late. You can always, always choose to be grateful. There's plenty of room on the road of gratitude. Believe me, it is not clogged up like the restaurant. There's plenty of room if you want to travel that road. Two men both seriously ill, occupied the same hospital room. Perhaps you've heard this story before. One man was allowed to sit up in his bed and for an hour each afternoon to receive his daily medical treatment. His bed was next to the room's only window. 
The other man had to spend all his time flat on his back. The men talked for hours on end. They spoke of their wives and their families, their jobs, their involvement in the military service, and where they had been on vacation. That's a nice thing to dream about these days, vacation. Every afternoon when the men in the bed by the window could sit up, he would pass the time by describing to his roommate, who was laying flat on his back and couldn't see it, what he saw outside the window. The man in the other bed began to live for these one-hour periods where his world would be broadened and enlivened by the description of activity and color in the world. The window overlooked a park with a beautiful lake. Ducks and swans played on the water while children sailed their model boats. Young lovers held hands and walked amidst flowers of every color of the rainbow. Grand old trees graced the landscape and a fine view of the skiddy skyline could be seen in the distance. And as the man described his view from the window in the exquisite detail, the man on the other side of the room would close his eyes and imagine this scene. One warm afternoon, the man by the window described a parade passing through the park. And although the other man laying on his back couldn't hear it, he imagined this parade in his mind's eye as the gentleman by the window developed a detailed picture with such descriptive words. One morning, the nurse arrived to bring water for their baths only to find the lifeless body of the man by the window, who had died peacefully in his sleep. She was saddened and called the hospital attendants to take the body away. Well, you guys know what was on the other man's mind. He wanted enough appropriate time to pass by, but he was itching to get in that bed that sat next to the window. Finally, when he thought enough time had passed by, he said to the nurse, can I switch beds? Can I be moved in the bed that overlooks the window with the beautiful scenery? The nurse was happy to oblige this person in the hospital, and after making sure he was comfortable, the nurse left him alone. Slowly and painfully, he moved his bed up. He propped himself up on one elbow to take a look at the world outside of his window. And finally, he would have the joy of seeing it for himself. He didn't have to have somebody else paint this vision for him, but he could see it all by himself. And when he had propped himself up and looked outside the window, he was shocked. The man called for the nurse and asked what could have compelled his deceased roommate, to describe such a wonderful scenery at the window. When he had finally been able to look out, what he saw was a brick wall. The nurse told the man, you know the guy that was staying in the room with you was blind. He couldn't see a thing. But maybe, maybe he wanted to encourage you. I think the moral of this story is even when we feel like we have nothing and we can't even see tomorrow, we can't even see, we can help somebody else. And by lifting the countenance of somebody else, we help ourselves. And when you help someone, you can't help but feel good despite your own situation. And when we help others, we help ourselves, and no doubt we become the hands and the eyes and the heart of God. Taking from our own spiritual bank account does not deplete it. It actually enriches us. Happy Thanksgiving. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we are taught in our scriptures we are taught on this journey that there is much to be grateful for. Our world often tells us that we need certain things to feel good about ourselves, that we need to buy, that we need to be selfish, that we need to think about ourselves. And yet this text of gratitude today calls us 
It calls us to a different space. It calls us to a different life. And it's not that we have so much, but we do. We do. Help us to count our blessings. Help us to cultivate this spirit of gratitude. Help us to help one another and help us in helping one another and helping ourselves to help our God. Amen.